Next, uh, so raise your hand if you were with us last year in June in Orlando. Okay, awesome. Look at all the new people that means we have here. So the one piece of feedback we got, consistent piece of feedback we got from you all last year was, don't do it in June in Orlando again. <laughs> we heard you, so we did it in August in D.C. Um, we have almost, last year we had about 100 people in person and I believe 200, 250 virtually um, and then 10 exhibitors. This year we have almost 300 people that will be rolling through these doors and in these seats over the next uh, two and a half days. 15 exhibitors in the other room and four demos of, of content that VA has actually developed for VA. Um, so we hope, again, so much that you'll spend some time over in those rooms. And then we have almost 500 people joining us virtually. So to our virtual audience, thank you so much. We're really grateful that you're joining us as well. Um, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Walter Greenleaf. And also, as he's coming up, just want to say, for those of you who were with us last year, if you recall, we were never on time. Um, in part because we, there was so much conversation and so many questions. So we've built this year some more time into the agenda uh, to really allow for those questions, conversation, as well as the experiences across the hallway. Um, so Dr. Greenleaf, if you would join us. Um, I do, again, did not get formal bios. I just want to tell you what I know about these phenomenal people. So, so Walter, um, as he um, would probably prefer me to call him. Yes, or please. You, okay. So Walter, uh, we used to call him the godfather of VR, but I think Think that may have sort of a negative connotation for some people. <laughs> so we call him the OG um, of virtual reality and immersive technology. Um, Walter has been a phenomenal uh, mentor of mine and Caitlin's and increasingly Evan's as well. Just a, um, a brilliant mind in the space and someone who's really able to forecast uh, where this is going. So it's an honor to have you here with us, Walter. And uh, with that, I'll concede the stage. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anne, and it's uh, certainly my honor to be here. And I should mention to the audience, uh, when Anne invited me to give an, a talk this morning, she said, could you cover all of what's going on in digital healthcare, all the innovations, what's around the horizon, where have we gone, where are we going, and specifically what's going on in the VA, and what's exciting? And I said, in how much time? And she said, well, you know, leave time for questions too. I said, Ann, that's going to be really a challenge. She said, well, it's a very intelligent audience. Just skip every third word. They'll fill in the blanks. <laughs> so we are going to go along at a very fast pace. I do want to save some time for dialogue afterwards and uh, also hopefully for some controversy. So jumping right in, um, one of the things that I'm very conscious of, I spent some time as the uh, director of the Mind Division for the Stanford Center of Longevity. And at the time, I learned that we are expecting predicting because of demographics, it's just a matter of doing the math, a healthcare crisis that's looming. Now we have 10, 15 years to get ready for it, but the impact will be significant if we're not ready. And that's the, the crisis of an aging population, both in the US and worldwide. The worldwide population has doubled since the 1970s. Family size has shrunk. We will not have enough uh, caregivers to deal with an aging population, especially with the concomitant problems of Alzheimer's, uh, other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, challenges with mobility, um, and you know the problems that have uh, plagued us for for eons will still be with us unless we come up with innovation solutions to address them. Um, chronic pain, stroke, uh, cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, those problems are with us and with an aging population living longer, the, the challenge of maintaining and supporting that aging population will be there. And we, and we have new problems to deal with too. Healthcare demand is evolving and changing with changes in lifestyles, uh, higher proportion of anxiety disorders in our culture, depression, burnout, uh, we'll hear more about that later, addictions, uh, diabetic uh, cares, weight management issues, and we need to take action now to get ahead of the curve. Now, the trend of addressing this, part of it is moving the um, time we intervene to an earlier stage in the disease. If we wait to the end of life care, it's extremely expensive. The more we can get involved, the more we can adapt our technology and focus our interventions to earlier in life, the, way, the more we'll reduce that economic burden that could bankrupt uh, society if we don't get ahead of the curve. We're also shifting 
where healthcare happens. We're leveraging technology to not wait till people are at the hospital, but getting involved both preventatively and hopefully prevent people ending up in an expensive situation. The only way we can do this is to leverage technology. We can't grow enough caregivers in time. We must leverage technology to do that. And that's what one of the reasons we're here today is how can we apply the next generation of technology, get ahead of the curve, make effective use of it, make sure it matches the needs correctly and that we don't leave anyone behind. And specifically, I'm particularly excited, I know everybody in this room is, about the impact that immersive systems will have uh, on healthcare. I think in many ways it's a profound sea change in our ability to reach, to motivate, to engage, and to provide um, healthcare solutions to, to individuals. Um, we've had decades of research on the correct application of immersive technologies, where it can be effective, where are the blind alleys. And I'll talk a little bit further about that. Recently, uh, the technology has moved to, from something that was very expensive, uncomfortable to use. We're seeing a surge now in more easy to use, less expensive technologies, and we can apply them based on you know, the findings we've had over the last uh, three or four decades. Um, this is new ways to provide health care. And we have to be creative and clever about how we apply it. And again, make sure we do it the right way. And um, I think we're poised to see the technology move away from the early adopters. And so excited that the VA has put so much effort into helping clear the pathway to apply this technology in the best way. We're starting to see it move from the early adopters into the mainstream in, ma in many sectors. And I think this is important to realize that what we're doing here is not just important, it's meaningful. It's something that will make a big difference as we move forward, but we have to do it together. I think it's a, a challenge to shift healthcare. Healthcare has, for appropriate reasons, inertia. There's many reasons why things don't change easily, but we do need to make change happen, and we need to be clever about how we do that, and we have to work together as, as a group. I think there's a lot of room for collaboration in this arena. And I'm excited to see that we do have that. Now, I know we'll be talking later about different types of immersive systems. Uh, our nomenclature is still evolving. I, uh, I had the uh, opportunity to be in at the very beginning of the field, and we had a, a debate about what to call this thing, and we ended up calling it virtual reality, which was a bit of a glib phrase. Now, we have a number of other phrases coming in, mixed reality, augmented reality, uh, at this stage, we're saying immersive systems to connote the concept that the technology we're using has a spectrum of immersion and a spectrum of application areas. Uh, what's wonderful is that we're seeing an evolution of this new technology impacting the full stack of healthcare, starting with uh, training, uh, more objective assessments, this is particularly important, improved ways to do clinical interventions, ways to facilitate adherence. And this is one of the superpowers of immersive systems. Is there a fantastic way to motivate, engage, and uh, promote adherence in um, our users? Ways to reach uh, through telemedicine, uh, underserved populations, ways to motivate people to get ahead of the curve with prevention and wellness, and ways to collect data in new ways that will allow us to come up with more sophisticated interventions and a more precision approach to healthcare. Now, the tech titans have spent billions and billions of dollars coming up with the technology that we're using today. And there's a real temptation to view um, the tip of the iceberg of the head mounted display as what a VR system is. But there's a lot behind it, the analytics, the design of the content, uh, the therapeutic protocols. So as you have a chance to go out and see uh, what's on display and as you uh, experience VR systems, realize that there's a lot behind the head mount display and that will change. Right now what we have are some very awkward systems that often are, look strange to wear and we haven't quite gotten over that use. But there's new technology on the way. I'm very excited about Apple's coming into this with their design. Um, I think we're gonna see further surges and things that will be very comfortable to wear, that more in the frame, like frames of eyeglasses, providing those uh, interventions through it. So I spend a lot of time uh, working with different groups at Stanford, uh, trying to weave together and uh, bring the knowledge gained in their groups, uh, the Department of Psychiatry, the wearable electronics program, et cetera, 
However, I'm finding that the best way to make a difference in this arena is really to work with the early stage companies and the early adopters that are out there. So this, in a way, this is my disclosure side to say that I'm incredibly conflicted, uh, conflicted enough to be non-denominational in what I do. I really do think it's gonna take a, a, a large ecosystem to move technology forward. Academic groups providing the foundation research, groups like the Veterans Administration helping us understand the, the proper application and to get the feedback to the amazing groups that are working so hard as developers of this new technology. We, again, we have to work together as a community to move things forward, and we have to move as fast as we can for the sake of our patients. So to give a little bit of a context, uh, we are in the middle, um, maybe a little bit beyond the middle, in the digital health revolution. I'm sure many of you can realize when everything was an analog world in medicine with handwritten notes, uh, things that we would look at a device like a thermometer or a spigmometer, write down a value and uh, have it be in a piece of paper that would eventually perhaps end up on someone's desk. But now everything has been moved to a digital format. Uh, all, the, all the data that we need is being collected and can be aggregated the right way. Um, and we also have new platforms for reaching individuals. Uh, of the um, almost eight billion people in the world right now, more than half of them have access to a mobile phone. This is an incredible platform for both collecting data, pushing um, interventions, and facilitating communication and support. We're entering an era of cloud-based informatics, which allows us in healthcare to do some amazing things, to aggregate, and then we have to be careful about patient privacy and access to the data, of course. But we have ways now for scientists, for um, program administrators, for policymakers, for clinicians, and for individuals to have access in appropriate ways to a tremendous amount of very valuable data, and ways to leverage the, the knowledge and skills that our friends in the gaming industry, the entertainment industry, use to engage people and have them stick to a protocol, do what needs to be done in the often difficult process of healthcare. So this ecosystem of wearable sensors, clinician dashboards, uh, patient-facing applications, and cloud-based analytics is evolving in a very rapid way. We're also starting to see prescription digital therapeutics, the ability to write a prescription for a digital therapeutic that might be combined with uh, a device or might be combined with a medication or might be a standalone therapy. This is a big change in terms of our ability to prescribe and get to a patient a way to help them. And it's not just the uh, physical aspects of our health that digital health systems are evolving into. We're also getting new ways to evaluate and to support our cognitive and our emotional health. Capturing passively data from our cell phones with when people opt in to do this that can give a brain health biomarker, for example. Or voice analytics as a robust way to objectively measure anxiety or depression. Capturing information about our nonverbal communication, such as facial expressions, also as a biomarker for emotional or cognitive state. And then being able to challenge and get a reaction by using the power of a virtual environment. And we're seeing fantastic applications of this digital health layer to come up with combination therapies, ways to dynamically do adjust the dose for a patient, both of the, maybe a prescription medication or a medical device or a digital therapeutic. Ways to combine the therapies in a complex way to look at comorbid conditions appropriately. And again, immersive systems are fantastic for facilitating adherence. And we can collect data dynamically that helps us understand how to be most cost effective. What's exciting is it's not just these immersive systems that are evolving right now. We're seeing a confluence of technologies that are coming together and merging together to make a big difference. Um, I could spend a lot of time going into each of these, but we're seeing breakthroughs in AI, of course, new digital health platforms, uh, wearables, prosthetics, and plantables that are smart. Uh, new changes in how we develop pharmaceuticals uh, with decentralized trials, um, combination therapies robotics, nanotechnology, uh, wearable sensors. A lot of technology is moving fast and working with immersive technologies as the overarching platform for deployment. Um, I think what we're seeing uh, over the last few months in terms of the excitement about the applications of AI to clinical is gonna make a big difference and hopefully I'll have some time to spend a little bit of time about that, discussing that later. 
the bottom line, though, is that the role of the clinical team is dynamically changing, and we need to get ahead of the curve and adapt. It's a powerful force, but we need to shape it. Um, medicine is becoming more of an informatics-based profession. Um, there's still the need for empathy and interpersonal relationships as a foundation of the clinical care process, but dynamically collecting information, understanding that information is critically important. And it's very hard to stay on top of all the things that are evolving. And as we reach out to other catchment leaders uh, because of the power of telemedicine, the reach of the clinician is extending, but the burden on the clinician is too. So we have to make sure that the next generation care models place a greater emphasis on the clinician's ability to motivate the patient to adhere to a treatment plan. That's gonna be a core thing to do, to leverage the information that a clinician has to help engage a patient in their own healthcare process. And uh, it's gonna be a challenge. We have to understand the, the shift here and adapt to it. Uh, we're seeing a, a third generation of sensors coming out that can collect data passively and be used uh, as part of our healthcare um, process. We're entering, uh, as Beth mentioned earlier, the, the era of medical wearables. That's gonna make a big difference in terms of our way to both objectively measure a person's healthcare status and also pr dynamically provide uh, feedback and suggested changes. And again, the big breakthroughs and evolutions of new ways with machine learning, predictive analytics, uh, generative AI will make a particular difference in large language models evolving really fast. And you know, of course, there's been concerns about the replacement of uh, people and their, in their jobs because of AI, but the, the reality is it's, these are tools that can allow us to do our jobs more effectively and extend our reach. And I, I love the expression that clinicians will not be replaced by AI, AI. They will be replaced by those clinicians who use AI. It's an evolution, and we're applying the technology in an appropriate way. We can adapt and make good use of it. Um, I want to emphasize that there's also a big sea change coming from our friends in the tech industry, um, leveraging effective computing. The study of our emotions by looking at things like voice tone, facial expression, uh, body language, uh, behavior, interpreting that to understand our goals, our, our intentions, and our emotional and cognitive status by leveraging technology. Now, this is moving from an academic re research area into the next generation of technology that will be put upon us as our way of interfacing with each other, with information, and with the world at, at large. Uh, we're seeing this approach by the tech companies to try and personalize experiences, to interpret our goals, make our refrigerators, our buildings, our automobiles sensitive to how alert we are, how grumpy we are, what degree of cognitive impairment we might have as we're aging, to adapt, to adjust to us. And that's amazing, and it provides new capacities for us in the clinical community. Um, being able to measure these things dynamically and passively will give us great power to dynamically adjust protocols, especially in the fields of behavioral medicine. And uh, it's on its way. Um, it's something that will be brought forward in a competitive way by the tech companies, something we can leverage if we can get ahead of the curve. Uh, we're seeing new systems such as voice analytics uh, to capture emotional state, um, such as what is being done by Ellipsis Health and several other groups. Um, we're seeing an evolution of the digital twin paradigm, and as Beth mentioned earlier, that's something that was originally started uh, uh, in a government agency, um, coming up with abilities to model us do predictive modeling saying, well, what if we change this? If a person has knee surgery, what are the downstream effects on their ability to exercise? And do we need to do prehab to get them ready for it? And factoring that in with genetic and metabolic information. Um, being able to dynamically look at a patient and manage their health care with ways of understanding their progress. Uh, I love what Octave Biosystem does in terms of modeling the individual who has multiple sclerosis, capturing data dynamically, being able to identify flare-ups in advance and intervene before the problem becomes worse and to reduce healthcare costs by doing that. We're seeing new ways of capturing uh, information uh, such as uh, portable FNIR systems that can capture 
the activities of our forebrains dynamically and by looking at uh, met metabolism. Ways to collect information just by wearing something on our skin that might give uh, not just glucose levels, but other things that, are, that otherwise we might have to do, uh, take a blood sample to collect. We can collect dynamically, and these systems are being provided to consumers right now and scaling really fast. We're seeing 5G allowing us to collect information in a rapid way and on the edge, process it and provide it back dynamically. This means our immersive systems can dynamically respond to our attention, our pupil dilation, our gaze direction, our movements, and adjust themselves and the experiences we have in a virtual environment um, based on that cloud information and population data that's been aggregated so we can come up with a precision approach to the individual in real time without the delay of uh, the current speeds that we have. We're seeing new business trends that are going to have impact on what we're doing too. Again, the tech titans are moving into healthcare. It's not just going to be pharma, medical device, uh, healthcare networks, insurance carriers who are major, major players. We already see groups like Amazon and Apple coming in as major players in the healthcare arena. Changes in the regulatory landscape, it's been amazing to see how uh, the FDA has risen to the occasion and embraced and helped us. Uh, bring these new digital therapeutics out in a safe way, effective way, and understand how to do it in a way that's dynamic. Telemedicine, because of the pandemic, has gained traction in a way it never would before. and There's no going back on that, fortunately. And there's now a focus on mental health because we, we must do that. So I think we need to remember that there's an economy of scale to pay attention to as we look at things right now. With predictive analytics and prognostics, uh, we're going to see preventive medicine becoming a more important part of what we're doing. And that means we have to help patients on the difficult journey of healthcare understand the value of what they might be doing now that will impact them later. That means we have to do a better job of showing information to an individual and showing them the consequences of maybe not adhering to a particular healthcare pathway. This is where wearable sensors, uh, dynamic interpretation, and the ability to create a context that we can do with immersive systems comes into play. And I'll start talking a little bit more specifically now about VR and how we use it to leverage all this confluence of technology into one way of reaching an individual, one way for a clinician to interact with a patient. Um, we've had VR systems in research labs, mostly in academic centers, for decades now. It started out with very expensive computers that were uh, half a million dollars and very uncomfortable headsets. And back in 1987, the first commercial virtual reality system became available. And that's when I got involved, and it's been really exciting to see. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely had more hair back then, and it was a different color. But uh, it's been a long journey, and it's, it, I'm so excited to be here with you now to talk about it. Along the way, I've had amazing colleagues and friends who have uh, contributed significantly, and several of them will be with us today. I think I saw Skip out there. Yeah, he's here. Um, we're, there's people who have put their careers in to getting us to where we are now, and I'm so excited to be able to leverage their work. And it's important for you to realize that VR isn't something that just came out of a box six years ago. This is something that we've had decades worth of fundamental research to understand the value, to validate the interventions that we're doing right now. Now, we need to redo these studies with today's technology, larger pa patient sample sizes, et cetera. But there is a foundation of research that shows where the blind alleys are and where the effective pathways are and the value of this type of intervention. This is important because many people still tend to view VR technology as sort of a game that isn't really as substantial as all the research that we've done to show efficacy. And the technology is still evolving. Um, new, inter new aspects of it, for example, bringing uh, uh, the ability to have uh, uh, olfactory stimulus in a dimensional way within a virtual reality. That's pretty cool and we can leverage that. Uh, ways to get haptic feedback. Um, this is coming out, it will be less expensive in the future and less invasive, but we have it. And I believe you'll see systems with haptic feedback that are used for surgical skill training uh, um, in other application areas. We're getting better with having virtual worlds with virtual other virtual 
humans and avatars in it that look realistic, that can look like us, can sound like us, have our facial expressions, and have the subtle nonverbal communication that we do instead of looking robotic, that's on the way. And we're having uh, conversational avatars that can support uh, a clinician and provide additional um, dynamics with, with the patient, answer questions when the clinician may not be available. Um, again, larger virtual worlds instead of the, right now by and large, most of the VR systems that you'll see are in a way sort of uh, lonely. It's you interacting with other things and have experiences there. When other people tend to appear, they, they look like robots. We're getting better at that, and the next generation will be really robust. With cloud-based rendering, with generative AI, we'll be able to come up with experiences for the individual that match their culture, that match their age group and demographics, and their interest on the fly. And instead of spending a year to come up with a virtual environment that might match a particular demographic, we can do it almost uh, overnight. It's very exciting what's coming in there too. And we're seeing new changes in the uh, healthcare system in terms of reimbursement and business pathways to get to market. Uh, CMS has been working to establish uh, new, new reimbursement pathways and uh, um, we'll see a new evolution there too. So it's pretty amazing the broad reach of immersive technologies in healthcare right now. Uh, I stopped counting after 427 different uh, merging company, companies and technologies going after every clinical indication that I could find. It's uh, exciting to see this and it's just going to expand. The projections are that this will become more part of mainstream healthcare. Um, I think the current uh, analysis is indicating almost a $12 billion uh, market uh, by 2028. And this is not based on theory, it's based on parts orders and very clear projections uh, by the companies involved. And um, we're seeing, I, I should spend a moment just talking about why is VR so impactful and what is the neuroscience behind that? Um, what we're seeing right now, because we create experiences using VR, is a tremendous impact in terms of promoting adherence, engagement, and recall. Uh, because we can get somebody's body into a virtual environment, it becomes more of an experience rather than something that's passive. Because we can leverage uh, our ability to be engaged in a fun process, we can leverage the brain's reward systems and make something engaging dynamically, match the user's attention styles dynamically. Um, we can create content that has a feeling of presence. So instead of the passive experience of reading about something or watching a video, we can create an experience for the individual that they retain and recall later. And it's these experiences that become educational and motivating and engaging for individuals. Um, it's this active involvement that we get with VR that creates the, promote, promotes the additional adherence. We don't see that with cell phone based uh, technology, for example, that um, we can have amazing applications there. We can do them in a more amazing way if we expand them and put them into immersive context. So we can activate um, changes in the brain using our reward systems. We can shorten the feedback loop, show someone progress and how they're doing in their rehabilitation or their therapy. Uh, we can leverage the brain's mirror neuron systems, our ability to recognize emotional state in others and we can switch the perspective where we see ourselves from another point of view and that can help us understand the value of the context that we're going through with therapy. And uh, by creating experiences with strong emotional impact, we can uh, facilitate uh, engagement and retention. So it's the active involvement, the feedback of the individual, the way we design the experience to make them engaging and motivating, we can come up with cost-effective solutions. And part of this is we're able to add a layer of narrative story to what's uh, going on with the experience. Healthcare is often painful, difficult, and boring, but we can take the lessons from the movie industry, um, our gaming industry, how to have people have a journey through their healthcare process with help along the way, and make the healthcare experience more of a um, dynamic experience with input from other people and a story arc to it. And we all know that story is what promotes 
retention and memory in individuals and creates the context and relevance for a therapeutic process. Uh, what we're, again, what we're seeing is better adherence with VR systems compared to mobile systems which have a very uh, challenging dropout rate. Uh, one of the uh, projects we did at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab was to have people have an experience of getting to know their future self. We created an avatar of an individual. We would age progress it and then have them have a dialogue with their future self about the value of exercise or the value of eating properly or saving money for retirement. It shifted people's attitudes and behavior to have that dialogue with your future self in a way we could not do it by any other means. So I think we're finding new ways to engage people in their healthcare process, show them by shortening the feedback loop the value of what they're doing. And I'm, I, I want to emphasize that I feel that what you're doing here in the VA health system is going to have tremendous impact, already is having tremendous impact on the rest of the clinical ecosystem. Uh, I'm impressed by the number of people, just in a very short amount of time, uh, Anne and Caitlin and team, how you've reached so many, uh, so many individuals, so many clinicians with your outreach. I think this will have tremendous impact because VR has been sort of lurking around, ready to get out there in use, but it's taken this group to sort of take the plunge to move it forward and it will have great impact. So again, it's the full stack of healthcare where we're seeing the impact of immersive systems, uh, all aspects. Um, starting with clinical skill training, interpersonal skill training, equipment and tools. Um, we're seeing the evolution of standardized patient simulators with diverse cultural and age backgrounds so that um, we can practice having critical conversations, particularly important if we have to deliver uh, bad news to a family. We're seeing um, We're seeing uh, amazing ways to uh, prepare uh, clinicians to handle uh, emergencies. Much like a flight simulator, we can prepare someone for something that they may never encounter, but when they do encounter it, they need to be prepared by having that experience. Uh, we're seeing new ways of uh, training people to do complex procedures, uh, su such as a surgical skill uh, rehearsal, something that can be done cost-effectively and leveraging the, the work you've already been doing in uh, surgical skill training. I've been um, very impressed by the way some of the companies have moved forward into coming up with new ways of training people to do a surgical skill, leveraging the data that comes out of it and dynamically uh, giving feedback to the individual of how best to do the procedure, study the experts and be able to come up with which works best in a surgical skill. Uh, I think it's really important that we're now moving, especially in behavioral medicine, into an era of more objective assessments Instead of asking someone, how did they feel last week? What was the effect of that medication? Um, how do you feel today? We're coming up with objective measurements to complement those subjective measurements. Uh, of course, in physical medicine, uh, being able to measure uh, range of motion and strength uh, as part of a rehabilitation process is critical to show feedback and give guidance. But it's also expanding into other areas of um, clinical care. We're building sensors into headsets, which allows us to collect the dynamic uh, information. We can challenge an individual with an experience, see how they react, and dynamically uh, assess how they're doing based on those signals built into the headset. Uh, we're seeing new ways to come up with standardized challenges. We can't really measure a cognitive process or an emotional state um, unless we challenge the individual with an experience. And again, that's what virtual environments are particularly good for, creating an experience on demand. And we're seeing companies are going really deep, leveraging this ability to evoke um, a cognitive or an emotional or a social emotional um, reaction to an experience by building very complex environments to dynamically assess uh, somebody's reaction, combining this with the psychophysiological and physical measurements simultaneously with challenging uh, them with an experience. And then we can do some very detailed analytics behind the reaction that people have in these virtual environments to come up with a very objective score of someone's emotional state and reaction to a challenge. Again, a much more objective way of uh, measuring social, uh, emotional reactions to a stimulus. 
Uh, we're also seeing some amazing things in terms of coming up with standard cognitive evaluations. I was very impressed when I saw what uh, several of the companies are doing where they use a VR headset to come up with a very detailed measurement of all the executive functions. And this allows us to start coming up with new cognitive assessment uh, platforms where we can come up with a, a very detailed analysis and again as part of our digital twin approach for an individual to help us understand the impact of the therapies they're having. For example, someone who might be uh, uh, going through uh, cancer therapy where we might be concerned about neurotoxicity for, for the chemotherapy, we can, we can uh, evaluate that dynamically and almost in real time uh, using our VR systems. We're coming up with new ways to um, come up with ways of exercising uh, our brains cognitively. And I've been impressed by the work of Adam Ghazali's lab where they've been able to show that virtual reality-based training can change the executive functions, the cognitive functions of an individual in their 60s or 70s in a way that, that is persistent. Uh, they did a, uh, some original studies showing that they can change the curve for an individual who is having the normal cognitive decline that we see in aging. And then they went back uh, later to see if the uh, changes that they got by their VR intervention were persistent, and they did. They persisted, I think they followed up more than uh, six months later to say that the, the uh, change in increased cognitive skills that were a result of their intervention persisted over time. So we're coming up with new ways of having a library of neurocognitive challenges and assessments. Uh, we're, we need to build upon this library to make it more diverse. And we're coming ways to uh, build into dynamically ways of collecting the signals about our emotional state. And this is evolving us, uh, putting us in a position to come up with a precision approach to mental health and wellness, for example. Uh, Lee Williams and her group at Stanford are categorizing people into different uh, uh, neurocognitive processes and then using that information as an integration of all the data they can get from medical imaging, genetics, metabolics, all the omics, putting it together, coming up with a way of uh, correlating that with what we see with the VR challenge, coming up with ways to dynamically come up with different biotypes and then send the patient down a different clinical pathway based on their biotype very important for mental health care. We're seeing uh, companies using VR and AR systems as a dynamic way to come up with an ecologically correct way of assessing someone's uh, cognitive state. And applying this to research, uh, doing studies with large cohorts uh, using VR systems which do not have a learning effect to dynamically look at uh, new drugs for neurodegenerative disease, for example. And of course, we're seeing some amazing interventions being enabled by VR. Um, I love the work that uh, Rob Lewis and others are doing in terms of designing uh, a, with preoperative planning, a surgical approach, and then in the OR, overlaying the surgical operating field with uh, uh, information from that preoperative plan dynamically to do a more effective job of surgery. Uh, there's so much amazing work being done in the field of uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation. So many amazing companies, you'll see uh, demonstrations of that uh, next door uh, today. And it's making a big difference in what we can do with uh, rehabilitation and also again in mental health care. And um, we really do need to make a difference in health care. We've, we've been so far backed up in terms of reaching people who finally make that difficult decision to make a call to help ask for help with their addiction or with their anxiety disorder and only be told that there's a multi-month waiting list that they'll be placed on. We can do better than that and, and we are. Um, virtual environments are being used to address almost every aspect of, uh, of challenge in behavioral and mental health care, ranging from uh, addictions and depression to attention deficit disorder and autism spectrum disorder, uh, psychosis, uh, it's, again, the full stack of issues in behavioral health care. We're seeing amazing uh, interventions being done with uh, VR systems. A lot of work. Uh, Anne mentioned earlier the challenge uh, that pain, chronic pain can have with, uh, with suicidality. A lot of great work using um, VR as both an uh, intervention for uh, acute problems with pain and also chronic pain management. 
And again, tremendous work, very appropriate for our patient population of veterans addressing uh, post-traumatic stress uh, and anxiety disorders. And new ways to uh, use virtual environments to help with addictions, helping people to uh, practice refusal skills and situational confidence, being to go into a virtual party and practice saying no when they're, they're being pressed by their friends to, to uh, take one more drink of alcohol, for example. And with generative AI, we can now customize those situations to the individual's social economic level and their cultural backgrounds, so having it be something that might be inappropriate. And we're also coming up with new ways to uh, get ahead of the curve and help people learn the importance, again, through feedback of uh, um, better nutrition, better exercise, showing the, the value of this by changing the feedback loop, seeing people immediately see their avatar get healthier after exercising and making the right food choices. And we're coming up with new ways to help people manage their, their mood with um, very engaging applications that uh, effectively teach meditation mindfulness on the fly. And again, helping people um, uh, make the right food choices by having them practice this in a virtual environment and having that uh, show them the consequences of the choices they make. So I talked earlier about uh, my concern about an aging population. Nicely enough, many of the things that are going on in virtual environments are directly applicable to the challenges we have in senior care. New ways to do objective assessments, uh, ways to address isolation and loneliness, addressing acute and chronic pain, depression, stroke rehabilitation, designing for disabilities, post-discharge follow-up, we can do that with an avatar of the clinician, and again, facilitating staff training. There's a tremendous overturn of staff in the senior care arena, and we can facilitate that uh, by having better training systems and uh, better preparation for the staff. So what are the constraints? Uh, what do we need to work together on to solve? Uh, well, we still have to do more research. There is a foundation showing the value of the approach, but we need to do this with um, larger sets of patients and also with um, technology evolving pretty fast. So we need to be prepared to stand up um, larger distributed trials, leveraging the technology as it comes out. Um, we need to address the perception of VR as a, as a um, video game. We, people still view it as a very science fiction type of approach rather than a very powerful clinical tool. There's going to be a big interoperability challenge. Uh, right now, with different headsets, different data structures, different heuristics of how one might move through the virtual environment. Uh, uh, and by the way, you can simulate sickness doesn't have to happen. But it will happen if the if the environments are designed incorrectly. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to happen because of the headset. If we give people agency to move through the virtual environment, it's unlikely that they'll have simulator sickness. If we move them through the sim, uh, through the uh, virtual environment without giving them agency, it's almost guaranteed to create uh, simulator sickness. But we do need to address the interoperability issue and get ahead of that. Right now, it's a. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, I know there's clinics that have 10 different applications on three different types of headsets, none of which will speak to each other. So that's an issue that we need to address. And I think all too often, the uh, many amazing companies that are developing VR products, uh, the early stage companies, um, haven't had a chance to really understand the needs of the user. They apply new technology to a problem, which is fantastic but they often don't have the ability to reach out and completely understand the financial impact, the time impact of what they're developing. And that's something where we can provide feedback and help them understand how to design systems that match the healthcare ecosystem appropriately. So to summarize, and I'm glad we'll have some time for questions, um, things are changing and um, clinical care is becoming more of an informatics-based uh, system. We can leverage new technology to make that transition easier. We're seeing a new generation of healthcare technology that, and a new way of evolving business models, a new place for clinical care, and we need to adapt to this. We need to get ahead of the curve. And again, I think the, the VA healthcare system is, is pushing and leading that charge in a very effective way. We need to make sure this gets translated out to the rest of the healthcare ecosystem. 
And um, over the next um, five to 10 years, we're gonna see some changes in how healthcare is provided. And I think the data integration is gonna become a key point. Data is starting to become a commodity that, uh, you know, the companies, the new companies that are coming in, providing better measurement technologies, better data sets that are accumulating with our wearable sensors, for example, will be competing for market share based on their control of data. So one of the things that I think that uh, we need to be careful about is to understand who owns the data, how do we share the data in a safe way, but also leverage the power of uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, systems and federated learning approaches so that we can share data, but keep it also confidential and, and private. And it's something that uh, there's sort of a land grab going on right now for what data sets. But the good news is we've had decades of underlying research. We're able to do a surge forward right now to move uh, the technology out. And we have new methods to address some otherwise very difficult problems in healthcare. So again, I want to emphasize that the work we're doing is, is important, that it's a collaborative effort, I think, to help move things forward. And uh, we are definitely getting there. Okay, thank you very much.